Welcome, everybody, once again to another edition of the Edup Experience Podcast. Or as our host, Joe, usually likes to say, it's your time to ed up. I, I figured I had to steal that at least once yes, during absolutely. this mini series. So we come to you today with, uh, sadly, the last of our six part mini series. Um, we're just simply calling it Putting Learnings into Action. But uh, I am, again, your host, Andy Bennis, and I'm the chief of staff at Los Angeles Pacific University. And once again, my partner in crime is Jamie Brownlee Turgeon, Vice Provost of Graduate and Professional Studies at. Point Loma Nazarene University. And before I give it back to you, Andy, Uh your title's different. It is different. Thank you for noticing. It's like getting your hair cut and somebody notices. It feels good. Although that's more of a, usually more of a woman thing than a man thing. (laughs) I don't care if you notice if I got a haircut. Yes, the title did change. um, Chief of Staff, New Responsibilities, and a whole whole new world. Sorry. (laughs) For Disney fans everywhere. Uh, No, I'm excited. New venture, new chapter, just in time for for this episode, speaking of putting things into action. Yeah, it's pretty relevant for your new role. It's going to be exciting. Um, We wanted to end on, well, I know you and I are kindred spirits in this, just knowing what I know of you. We wanted to end on a practical note. And so I know you and I have been in meetings in the past. We've been at conferences where, in my mind, and sometimes out loud, we'll go, okay, great. Therefore, what? Right. What's the takeaway? How do I do something about this? And that's sort of what this episode's uh, all about. Jamie and I both wanted to just chat about. And by the way, I'm I'm pointing at you when I say this because you are a conference junkie. I I am. Even even I mean, I enjoy them, but even way more than me. And I don't mean that pejoratively. It's just the truth. You love going to conferences. You love speaking at conference. You're like you're a conference addict. Yeah, I fully agree with that statement, Andy. <laughs> I do. I love networking, meeting people, presenting, learning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it just is fun. I, I, I was going to say that, and lest that sound negative, you're not a junkie for conferences for conferences' sake. It's the networking, it's the people, it's the conversations. Yeah, let's just for budget's sake say I don't go to every conference I can. Right? Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> Who does? In case someone uh, you know above me at my work is listening. Who does? Well, I, I once had a conversation not too long ago with Seth O'Dell, who we all, from, oh, from yes. Ken Home, right? Seth's great. Um, phenomenal blogger in the higher ed space. For those of you who don't uh, know who he is, runs a, a did, you know direct marketing agency or uh, sorry agency of record and and uh, in the digital marketing space. But he's also a consultant and massive resume. Anyway, phenomenal. But one of his big deals was remember Southern New Hampshire with their bus, the the, mm-hmm. the wrapped bus, and they went across the country getting out diplomas. His brainchild, and he revealed the other day in a meeting, he spent forty five days living on that RV. Wow. When they drove around the country. So they said, great idea. You get to live in it and drive it around with the camera crew. Um, so that just reminded me, having great ideas sometimes means you get to travel um, 45 days solid in an RV. You don't get to do that with conferences. No. Although we could. Like if you just said, I need to go to every conference that's offered this year. Can we wrap an RV with our school logo and branding and I'll just drive around all these conferences in the RV? I, we could pitch that. Yeah, my job could be lead generation. <laughs> You know, via conferences, getting the the brand out in the RV. I just thought it was, it was was great to finally, we've all seen the commercials, but to finally talk to Seth and realize one, that was his idea. And two, he was on that thing for 45 days. I did not know that. Yeah. He had the look on his face that said, it's not as glamorous as it sounds. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Kind of like being a rock star, you know, touring the country. Yes. He's like, yeah, it was fun. But anyway, so speaking of innovation, wrapping an RV and driving the country. um, So. Whether it's books, because I know you're an avid reader as well, mm-hmm. blogs, books, podcasts, a lot of us spend a lot of time consuming information. I'll, sometimes it's just in the name of um, learning something new, hearing a different perspective, or even just trying to solve a specific problem, right? My organization is facing a unique challenge. I got to dive into this topic. Who's a, a, a respected author in the space or what are the current trend lines in this area, who do I need to read, all that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And we all go to a lot of the same publications online and and so on. Great stuff. And I don't know about you, but I'm, you know, I do take notes. I'll save snippets. I bookmark stuff online. You know, I come back to it whenever I can. And, And so I get pretty good at shorthand or saving digital bookmarks or even audio files, PDFs, whatever, folders full of stuff. So let me start with this. They say confession is good for the soul. Go for it. But bad for the reputation. (laughs) So I will confess, I am not always great at going back 
to those, right? Because if I'm using the same notebook for my day-to-day notes mm-hmm. or just brainstorm stuff, I take the same, you know, uh, composition journal or something, right, where I'm taking notes. Two or three pages later, I'm back to my day-to-day job. I do not often enough flip the pages back to say, what did I pick up there? What did I learn? How do I pull that forward into today? Um, I think you're better at that than I am because I've seen your notebooks in the past and I've seen how much no- how many notes you take. I've also seen you tape inordinate amounts of paper to the walls. Still do that. <laughs> to remind yourself <laughs> of all these ideas. Um, but let's talk about putting stuff into practice. Like you come home from a conference, your head's spinning with good ideas. You've got good notes. For you, Jamie, what is the next thing you do? Let's say you got home on a Friday from the conference. You wake up Monday morning. You, these All these ideas are sitting there on paper. What's the next thing you do? Well, first, I don't wait till Monday morning because everyone's going to bombard me when I walk yeah, in that door. Point. That's a great um, point. So I like to take the practice of read through my notes, really identify the meat because you get a lot of quotes and statistics, but you're going to find those statistics in other articles that you're reading. So what is the meat of what I got that are potential items I can put into action? That's what I'm looking for. And I jot them down in a location where I know I will go back to and I will carve out time for. But you said something about regular consumption that I want to highlight. Mm. If someone is going to a conference and saying, that's how I'm getting all of my ideas, and then I'm going to go back and make change, that doesn't work. It needs to be constant consumption. Mm. Because once you hear it at a conference – and then you read it in an article, then you hear it on a podcast, that starts to really resonate and you see that theme emerge Mm -hmm. and you go, oh, this is something I need to pay attention to. But if you only say, I'm going to the conference, I'm going to rely on this for all my learning for the year, you're not going to put anything to action. Interesting. That's a good point. So the first touch, whether it's audio or in person or whatever, is just the spark that says, oh, I need to keep this on my radar. Let mm-hmm. me go dig into other sources and either validate this or maybe sometimes it's just subconscious. You put it away and then you hear a podcast and go, ooh, I have heard that before. That's an interesting point. It has to be multiple touches and it has to be relevant. I think there's a lot of times we, we sit through things that we're like, okay, I probably could have given that talk or some version of it. So you don't fully tune in because there's a little bit of been there, done that. Um, or there's a no way we're going to pull that off at our institution. So right. You have that bucket as well. But, and that's, but I think that's all that, and not to rabbit trail too much, but it's related concept. Sometimes there's this issue of talking ourselves into or out of listening to something. And there's a danger of, of forcing some preconceived notions onto the topic, right? I assume I know everything about it, or at least enough for me to get by and do what I need to do. Therefore, I'm not going to tune in. I'm not going to listen carefully. And you might miss a new angle on it. Mm-hmm. Um, you you assume that because you once wrote a paper on a similar topic that your authority in the area carries over into everybody else's and there isn't anything new. So, yeah, I think there's as much – that could all probably be a separate piece of the episode. But there's as much danger in missing things if you go in thinking, I, I've been there, done that, I got this. Or, yeah, I've heard this before, therefore there's no need to implement. So this this, this – different difference between an idea and a change of action or process or thought. I think what you were just highlighting is the multiple points, touch points of exposure start to change your thinking. Mm-hmm. But do you have to have a new way of thinking before you implement? Can you do both at parallel, like start to try something new and that in turn changes your thinking? Or do you have to arrive at a new way of thinking before you do something new? Well, let me, let me take a different angle to that question. <sighs> Um, and anyone from Point Loma Nazarene University, there's my plug, um, (laughs) that is listening knows that I do this. If I read an article and I think it's relevant for someone, I send it to them. Mm -hmm. If I go to a conference and I'm getting, um, presentations and I go, oh, this person needs to hear it. I'm sending them these podcasts, the Ed Up podcast. I'm regularly saying, Hey, here's something innovative. I'd love for you to listen to it or read it. And then let's talk about it in the next meeting. I've added to multiple meetings, just a, Hey, you know, insights. And I put links into these Ed Up podcasts constantly when I go, this is relevant. These are the people I need to see it. So I think it's not just what am I doing with it? How do I help use what I'm learning to change other people's mindset so they can see the vision as well? And then we can have really good dialogue because mm-hmm. I can't make every change my own, on right. my own, right? right? 
unless you become authoritarian in your leadership style, right? So Correct. We're going this way, and you never explain why or how you got there. Correct. So I think that's a, in terms of practical takeaways. Number one, what do you do after a conference or you finish a book or you read an article? One, share it. Yep. Share it with colleagues, peers. You can share it up the food chain, down the food chain to your teams. Share it. Um, if for no other reason, at a bare minimum, it lets them know, in your case, for your team, all right, we know what boss is thinking. Mm -hmm. We know where her head is. So when she comes to us with some idea that maybe feels like out of left field, maybe we realize we can connect the dots and go, oh, that was born out of her thinking on this topic in this way, whatever. So sharing, that's that's super practical. I think one of the related items is this issue of, <clears throat> and we this came up in, in, in previous episodes for us, is specifically marketing, enrollment, and some of those other, you know, front end uh, departments and processes, we're so busy with the day to day. And this goes for everybody, but we're so busy with the day to day, we're, we're busy working in the business, in the processes, in the work, that we do not take the time to step back and work on it. And what I mean by that is, when you're, tr when you're checking off your daily tasks, you're putting out fires, you're holding your regular meeting cadences, you're pursuing your quarterly or semesterly or annual goals, or everybody's marching heads down, working towards that stuff. You know, going to a conference helps you think differently. And because you're out of the office, you start all of a sudden your creative juices start flowing. Mm -hmm. you're like, oh, what if we were to try a different way of doing that? What if we turn that upside down? Or what if we turn that on its head? Then you go back and the day-to-day -day catches up with you and the idea never makes it into a conversation or into a habit or a process. You just never even get to try it. Why? Something in the brain, the creative side shuts off and the practical execution part turns on. And sometimes it's like never the two shall meet, right? We don't go back and forth enough. So this issue of putting into practice, I think intuitively, I feel like part of that is give it some space deliberately. How do you do that? How do you deliberately give space in your day, in your week, in your mind to that? I need to step back and work on these processes, not in. Uh, yeah, I'm very intentional about that because we can get just caught in that whirlwind and never get out. Um, so we have a meeting structure in my domain. And pretty much we do meetings Monday through Thursday, and then Friday is a work day. Mm -hmm. So my team knows they can G-chat me and we can jump on a quick call if we need to. But otherwise, I'm working on the business and I want them to be working on the business. So we don't do any types of working groups or any regularly set meetings on Friday. It's meant to go work on the business. And I think they appreciate it because they know I'm not going to be setting up a bunch of meetings just filling up another day. Mm -hmm. I appreciate it because they know, hey, Jamie's available if I need her, but otherwise I'm giving her that creative space and I have all Friday to be able to do that. Interesting. So for you, that's a day to focus on processes, maybe a new way of looking at things or doing things. Yeah, I'm mean, in talking to people and just thinking about the way I handle it. People do this obviously differently, right? When it comes to time management, some people do time blocking, you know, mm -hmm. where they're just they're throwing a half an hour or an hour into a calendar for a task on the calendar, it looks like a meeting, but they're just heads down on something. Um, I know people who can jump in and out of that very well, right? They just, I mean, you know, I mean, our president wakes up, I know he's up at like four 30 because I'll get emails from him at 5. AM. Um, luckily he doesn't expect him to respond <laughs> that early, but people can compartmentalize. All right, I'm shutting that down for a second. I'm putting the phone on silent and I'm just going to read and I'm going to journal or I'm going to mind map some stuff. Um, that's hard. I think there's a discipline behind that. Like with any kind of discipline, there's some practice. You have to decide it's a good idea. Baby step your way into it, right? Until it becomes a habit. And so in whatever form, there's no way around dedicating time to it. Protected, dedicated, assigned time. You have to find it. It has to be deliberate, right? It can't just be, I'll do it when I get to it. So here's something I actually learned from your president of LAPU.edu. Um, <laughs> I learned a lot of, of practices that were just made so much sense from him. But one of his um, ways of the meeting structure was he didn't have meetings early in the morning and he didn't have meetings late in the afternoon. And he explained one time, he goes, Jamie, we just kind of do them mainly in the middle of the day because then we're all focused on work in the middle of the day. But if you're a morning person, 
you have a little extra time in the morning to whether it's reading and learning, whether it's strategy. And then those that are night people have the afternoon and into the evening to let their brain thrive and do their creativity that they need to do. And so we also have that plan. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's funny when we meet with people outside of our division because they'll schedule a meeting at 830 and everyone on my team is like, don't they know we don't do that here? (laughs) And they don't. They're like, no, we can start at eight. No, we don't start at eight. Well, you can always just block it out (laughs) and make it look like your whole team only works four hours a day. Yes. I'm unavailable. We're we're at Starbucks all morning. I'm sorry. We just, we don't get to work till 10. We're about two. We're just taking a nap and wrapping up. It's happy hour somewhere. But part of that is because people, if they start putting tasks on their calendar in the middle of the day, Mm -hmm. we have a bad um, practice of just double booking. I'll look at my calendar sometimes and I'll see three things and and they're not tasks. They're all legit meetings. I'm like, I cannot possibly be in three. Who double booked me? Triple booked me. But it happens all the time. So we just say, hey, unless it's urgent, don't do the don't. Don't cross off those times in the middle of the day. We do like 10 to 3. Yeah. Sometimes we sneak to 9. Sometimes we sneak to 4. But yeah. we really try to do 10 to 3. By the way, we're still on so that, that cadence, but mostly now because we're a multi-time zone yes. workforce. And so it's not fair to make the folks in Florida you know, get, jump into a meeting during dinner time just because you suddenly want to. Um, so there's some practicality to that now. But I, I think the point there is being deliberate, creating some margin. And I think you've got to be aware as a leader – Okay, whatever scope of responsibility those who are listening might have, the, you're different. You might not get to that creative space right away. And so mm-hmm. your, your point about mornings, I know for a lot of people that vision of, hey, I'd love to, I'd love to get up a little early before the day has started. Maybe if it's still even a little dark out or just sun starting to come up. It's quiet. Mm-hmm. I grab my coffee. I do a little reading. That's some of your contemplative thinking. And if that needs to extend, you know, past... Uh, 10, 15 minutes, half an hour, an hour, whatever it is to allow you to get into that space. I think being deliberate about it, I think some of us feel guilty if we don't get to work right away, get busy, hurry, just jump in. The to-do list is long. Go, go, go. There's so much value in that sacred space, even if however long you can afford to do it for, have a journal, have a pen and paper handy as the ideas come, just jot them down. You can flush them out later, but just let that stuff flow. Some people can do that almost immediately. I mean, I've met people whether you know people who meditate, pray, nap. <coughs> Excuse me. My wife hates that I can, if I'm exhausted, like on a Sunday afternoon, I'm like, babe, I'm just going to knock out for half an hour. I put my head on the pillow and I'm out in five minutes <laughs> for the full half hour. She's like, I hate you. <laughs> you fall asleep so fast. Um, some people can get to a very reflective, deep thinking, creative space pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. Some can't. Um, there are some of us whose spouses joke, it takes you the first two days of vacation to realize you're on vacation. And then the th- morning of the third day, you seem relaxed and fully rested. You fully sunk into your chair type of thing, your beach chair or whatever it is. And I think this is the same thing. If you can do it in a half an hour in the middle of your day, while it's a war zone around you work-wise, great, go for it. If you know you're not that person, then do it on the front end or the back end when you can shut down <clears throat> and and give yourself the space, the mental space you need to arrive at that creative place. Mm-hmm. And, and that goes for letting this other stuff sink in too. Re- rereading your notes from a conference, mm-hmm. you know? Well, and I think I like that you comment as leaders that we don't do that enough because um, we get sucked into the day-to-day. Everything yeah. seems urgent. And I'm I'm about to schedule a series of meetings with a number of our academics and they want the meetings this month. I'm doing them for late September. I can't, we're going into the fall start. I can't can't do long meetings that require a lot of prep. So it's like, if you want my brain spot on, give me the time to contemplate, give me the time to prepare, give me the time to work on the business so that when I show up, we're ready to go. Mm -hmm. And my team knows you give me that time. We're ready to go. Yeah. But I also love that you mentioned how deliberate you are about sharing articles with them, sharing your thinking with them, because then as you shape your meeting agenda, you know, they, they're already on board. Um, you know, we, we've implemented a couple of different times, the Amazon style of meetings where tra- traditionally you send somebody an article and say, read this or listen to this podcast or whatever. And on Wednesday, when we meet, we're going to talk about it. And people show up and they either didn't read it. Or two minutes before the meeting, they realized they haven't, and they just skimmed it. 
and they're not nobody's on the same page and they haven't all been there done that reddit so the amazon style is no we're going to read it in the meeting so here's a here's an article or here's a piece we're going to take 10 minutes right now in the silence of this meeting to read it so underline if you must Ooh. highlight if you must we're going to all read it together and then talk about it so that everybody knows and you can't do that by the way with a 30 page white paper but you know what i'm getting at yes um sharing it so that people know what you're thinking and how and when matter of fact <laughs> when when i first started the new role and transitioning from associate vp of marketing and communications to chief of staff which of course lets me now take on a more global org level view of things and i thought all right well i've been pretty myopic on the marketing and enrollment space except for my time on the president's management team where i get to think more strategic but I'm like, okay, now this is a full-time gig now. Now I'm thinking full-time organizational level. So I messaged our president and I said, okay, so John Hutt, what that I'm not already reading do I need to read, right? Because everybody's got, you know, from IHE to the Chronicle to whoever, the Daily Dive and Higher Ed, there's some really great little nuggets and blogs and newsletters and stuff you can sign up for. And I'm like, I need to expand my reading and my thinking for exactly what we just talked about. What can I implement that, I'm, that I can learn from? But oh my gosh. Now I'm just being forwarded. Oh, this is another good one. Okay. And this is another good one. Oh, the, the McKinsey report. Oh, this one. And, that, and I'm like, okay, now I need an extra day every week to just catch up on reading or an extra half hour in the morning or an extra hour in the afternoon. But I'm finding myself forced now into this making space because there's a lot more to ingest now than there was. So I, the, the lesson there, don't ask. <laughs> don't ask what else you should be reading because the list was just and of course he jokingly replied okay maybe half jokingly replied well that's why i get up at 4 30 yes <laughs> like, okay so for those of us who are never going to wake up at 4 30 how do i fit this in but there's a reality to that that you have to we, we've all heard that uh cliche right leaders are readers mm -hmm. um which reinforces your point about constant intake so that you're aware of trends um, and and one person's one time idea versus a sector wide movement. Yep. Right. Um, I think it's it's mad. so for creating the margin, finding the margin, and then you've already hinted at socializing. I want to go deeper there on the socializing. It how much does it matter or is it important to find collaborators around you or like-minded people around you. And here's where I'm coming at from this, because I want to hear your, your, your take, because you work with a lot, you, we've both worked with a lot of different personalities in mm -hmm. different contexts. Leadership can sometimes be very lonely because you come with a new idea. Let's say you're the only person from your organization who went to that conference. You come back with some really inspirational idea. Everybody else at the table Monday morning it was, is not in the same space you are. Some are eager to listen and go, that's fantastic. Tell me more. Others are like, whatever, I got stuff to do. It can be very lonely to be the one with that new idea. So how, how do you, you mentioned sharing it already, but how, how, beyond that, how do you then make it part of the thinking or introduce it as a new idea? If you're the boss, fine. You do it as gently as you can, but you can decide which direction you're moving. If it's to your fellow, if it's to your peers, your colleagues, or let alone above you, president or the cabinet or whoever, how important is it to have collaborators or, or, you know, like-minded folks to lock arms with and help you, you know, uh, uh, chant the mantra and get the idea out there? A couple different ways. Um, one is not looking at doing it in a group setting and saying, who are the key people that I need to see this vision and start to create champions around the campus? Uh, that's why when I send it out, it's usually individualized and really specific. I don't want to overload any one person mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. tons of stuff. So you're not spamming the entire organization. Exactly. Okay. I'm like, this is relevant for you. It might be relevant for five people, but I'm probably sending it individually to each mm -hmm. one of mm -hmm. them and then maybe following up with a dialogue. Um, case in point, I just sent uh, an article to a few people around AI that was released I, around um, career, career outcomes. And it tied to something I learned at a conference I went to a couple of weeks ago around AI. So I thought, okay, I got two points, right? Finding the trend, sent it out. And now our interim provost asked me to present on AI with our AI working group. I'm not on the AI working group. I am presenting with them because they're starting to see I'm sending these out. I'm studying it. I'm learning right. it. So 
that was kind of interesting. Just by sending some things out, people are like, oh, we want to bring you in now to talk about right. it further. Right. So they, they, they sniffed out that they've got somebody who's, who's sharing their thinking and, and not, you know, from a, from a political lobbying standpoint, Hey, there's somebody else on our side, but Hey, this is somebody with whom we can collaborate because they're hovering around this space. They're thinking in a similar way. Let's, let's fuel that. Correct. And in this case, I actually think the working group is the working group tackling it for our university. I'm the champion. I'm someone outside of that group that Mm -hmm. they're saying, how do we, Get her on board, too, because of her sphere of influence and it can spread. So that's one way. The other way is we just changed. I talked about meeting structure. It's really important for me. And I evaluate (laughs) it every summer. I know it's important for you. (laughs) So we just changed our monthly meeting to call it Data Insights to Action. Okay. And we're going to be looking at our own data monthly as well Mm because we have our KPIs and dashboards. and We've talked about that. Mm -hmm. But we're adding an element of what are you learning that others should know and what do we do with it? Mm. And it could be bite-sized learnings that have a bite-sized action, but it means that we're taking those being very intentional and using this space. One of my directors, he's over our military programs. He's like, Jamie, I'm reading this article that is changing some of the language and how we look at our military students on campus. I said, that's great. Put a presentation together. You're presenting at the next Data Insights to Action (laughs) meeting. He's like, okay. But like, that's what I want for all of them to be learning and sharing it and then saying, again, what's one little piece that we can course correct? Um, But but speaking of socializing, can I go to learning at conferences because you have identified mentors as something we should look at? Mm Uh, a practice I do at every conference is, well, you know, I'm on LinkedIn mm-hmm. and I love using LinkedIn, mm-hmm. uh, is I connect with every presenter on LinkedIn. Uh, if I go to their session and I find something very insightful, I will send them an individual message. Mm. I did this three years ago with um, CEO and president, Dr. Curry from Unity Environmental University. Uh, just connected with him, told him how much his presentation meant to me. That happened. The next year, he was there again. I sought him out. I was deliberate and said, hey, I would love for you to be my mentor. We started talking. We hit it off. He's like, yes, I will mentor you. And now at each conference, we get to connect and collaborate, but he's always a text away. If Mm -hmm. I need to talk to him or a quick question, he's willing to take it. It came from him presenting and me just connecting on LinkedIn telling him what I learned from his session, and it just was able to build. So I think there's so much about connecting with people at the conference, even if you don't talk to them at the conference. Connect with them on LinkedIn. Send them that message and start building your network. I have amazing network with some people I've never met. Mm. But I know I can go to them and talk to them. Well, let's face it. Sometimes that's the best way to do a relationship. (laughs) (laughs) No, in all seriousness, you're pointing to something very important, and and this is an acknowledgement to, you know, whether we want to go Myers-Briggs on this or otherwise introverts, extroverts, this is a, a, maybe a call to action to some of the folks from whom that doesn't come naturally. Find a place or a way that you feel safe or comfortable doing that. And maybe a more anonymously digitally is safer for folks because not everybody's got your courage live and in person to walk up to someone. Hey, you're so-and-so. Aren't, it's such a, I always wanted to meet. Uh, that's, that's the scariest thing in the world for a decent number of people, but I, I, I love the practicality of what you just said. Connecting on LinkedIn uh, is not nearly as scary um, behind the keyboard, behind the monitor. I don't want to say anonymously, but it's virtually, right? Um, it's a safer space for some folks. Absolutely. So I think the point to translate is do it in whatever way you feel most comfortable, but that it can't be done without the networking or the connection. Otherwise, it's just a one-way relationship. You're just reading and ingesting, but you're never connecting. I do the same thing when I read a good book. I look up the author on LinkedIn, connect if I'm able to, and send a message and tell them what I'm learning from so the book. you're a little book. bit of a stalker is what it comes down yeah, to. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. Right, but so- if I learn from that, trust me, if someone reads my book and reaches out to me and says, Jamie, this was really impactful. I'm using this book now with my team. I'm going to feel pretty good. Mm -hmm. I'll talk to that person again. So it's just being able to expand. And I think LinkedIn gives us that platform. I am an introvert. So get out of here. I am. No one believes me, but I am not including me. I don't believe you, (laughs) but I think it's an opportunity to build your network. And I always ask my team members, Hey, I want you to go ask your network this question about your area. What are they doing with military with this problem? 
come back and tell me if they don't have a network, how are they, how are they bringing things back? So a conference is a great way. You're getting all these names. They're yeah. putting themselves out there. Take the invitation. Yeah. I, I think that social element can't be understated in both contexts. You just mentioned networking. Some people are natural at it. Some people have to work at it. I think sharing ideas you have found blogs, podcasts, books, conference takeaways, whatever, socializing them where you are, your own team, your organization. Um, and I think it points to something you said earlier. If, if somebody called you or reached out to you about your writings and, 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 you know, called your baby beautiful, you're like, Oh, I know. Right. <laughs> you're happy to talk about it. It reminds me of that old sales axiom way back in the day. People buy for their reasons, not yours. And that's, mm -hmm. that goes way beyond just products. They buy into ideas for their reasons, not yours. So you mentioned something super important, which I think is a good place to start to wrap it, is that the things you learn are important to you for a specific reason. You cannot assume they are going to be important to another person for the same reasons. So you have to put a little extra thinking into uh, what value is this going to be to this person or that person or the other and translating those benefits of the takeaway into their context, because mm -hmm. you used a phrase when you were explaining your story, hey, I think this might help you, and here's why, or I think you would find, you're going to find value in this because. So you're helping them understand that there's a connection to their world and their responsibilities or their accountability with what the content of that thing is people are automatically receptive, right? That's just a communication skill. Put things in the context of the person you're talking to. Um, and, and that's a great practical step, which is, I think, which I think was our, our goal here. Um, because all too often, and again, I talked about confession all too often, some of these good ideas just die on the vine. They, they die on the paper. They end up buried in that journal, you know, 20 pages back and, and forget to get revisited. Um, and I think we all recognize that sometimes happens, um, but it'd be great to avoid it. Any other final thoughts from you, Jane? Final thought. If you are listening to this and you are not connected with me on LinkedIn, <laughs> Jamie Brownlee Turgeon. Please understand what you're signing up for, by the way. No, connect with me and start <laughs> building that network and connect with Andy. He's on LinkedIn as well. We'd yeah. love to dialogue around any of these topics. So if something really resonates with you and you want to pick our brain, yeah. we are open to that dialogue. Absolutely. As you can tell, LinkedIn is Jamie's Instagram. So not, it is. not nearly as many pictures of the dog um, as one might expect on social media, but no, absolutely. I think it's a, it's a great point. And to, to all of us listening, I think it's why we enjoy the conferences and the podcasts. Um, and that is the, the ability to, to connect and realize we've all got most of the same concerns and most of the same fears and most of the same questions. And, the ability to connect and chat about them and share learnings is, is super valuable. So well, as we wrap it up, um, we want to thank you for hanging with us for the series. If you don't realize that this was number six of a six part mini series, please feel free to go back and dig through the ed up episodes and find uh, Jamie and myself. The series was called the currency of change. And we've been talking about multiple angles on the issue of the, the changes and some of the headwinds in higher ed and uh, all the different angles uh, and elements of that in the last six episodes. So if you're intrigued um, or you haven't had enough of our voices yet, feel free to go back and search out the other five episodes. But we want to thank you for hanging in there and uh, joining us for the conversation. Um, and in the spirit of that, go share it with someone. Go have a conversation with someone. Invite somebody you haven't normally done it with to, to coffee, virtual or otherwise, and have some dialogue around these issues. Otherwise, we uh, thank you for joining us. Wish you the best of luck and take care. Stay tuned to more good stuff from the Ed Up experience.